Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, for those of you I haven't met, I'm Kate Kunow, the Curator of Collections and Exhibitions here at the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art. Uh, and today we're talking about not our most recent show, but one that I think kind of flew under the radar, which is Abstract Ideas. Uh, so let me pull up my PowerPoint really quickly here. Lovely. All right, can everyone see? I got a nod from Tina, so I'm forging ahead. Um, so abstract ideas, as I said, is a show that I think kind of flew under the radar. For those of you who aren't super familiar with the Cedar Rapids Museum of Arts exhibition schedule, uh, we usually do about three openings a year. And we schedule kind of our temporary exhibitions, which run around 15 weeks, to open around these times. Uh, our curatorial staff, of course, is myself and our wonderful registrar, Jackie, and our amazing preparator, Judy. Um, and so because we're a very small staff and we can't be in more than one set of galleries at a time, um, we have to make sure the schedule has us being able to take, you know, several weeks to change out exhibitions and not be in more than one place and not have too many things scheduled back to back to back. Um, so if you've been through the museum, as many of you I know have, you'll notice that um, of our 16 galleries, they change on varying schedules. Um, our most temporary galleries, or I should say our shortest run exhibitions are about 15 weeks. Um, there are other galleries with shows that are up for six months, galleries uh, like the ones that I'm going to talk about today that have an 11 month, you know, roughly one year run for the exhibitions there. Um, and others like the Grant Wood and Marvin Cohn galleries that don't really change at all unless there is a, a, a big event like the Whitney exhibition in 2018 where, we're, uh, where we need to change out the artwork for kind of an, an ex extenuating circumstance. Um, and so these exhibitions that don't have the traditional 15 week run of our temporary shows, um, their changes are kind of easier to have fall off people's radars just because they don't usually match up with our opening schedule. Um, and so they will kind of get tacked on to the rat cards that we send out for the openings after them. So I believe um, we're not doing a rat card for abstract ideas, but this one's kind of getting pushed in like our spring shows. Uh, so I did want to take a minute and kind of sing the praises of these longer run exhibitions. Uh, which I find really fun. They're a little bit challenging to put together just because as a museum, our rule generally tries to be that um, works on paper can be up for about six months. Um, ideally, then they should rest for about 60 months. So when you're planning a longer exhibition like this, that as I said, is up for around 11 months, you really probably wanna try and focus on painting, sculpture, um, hardier artworks that can handle that longer run without anything hurting it. So just to kind of get us in the idea of abstraction, neither none of these pieces are in the show. I'm going to preface that right away. Um, but from left to right, we have Robert Delaunay's Windows from 1912, Matisse's Yellow Curtain from 1915, Mondrian's Composition Number no. 10 from 1939, um, so obviously from these, we can tell abstract art generally is really strongly associated with the 20th century. Um, and if you're vaguely familiar with some artistic terms, you'll know that there are lots of movements and trends in the 20th century in which abstraction features really prominently. Um, you know, we can start with cubism, German expressionism, surrealism, famously abstract expressionism, of course, which I'll get to in a minute. Minimalism, pop art, and op art are amongst the many 20th century movements that dealt with abstraction in some degree. And so what is abstract art? Abstract art uses the visual language of shape, form, color, and line uh, to create compositions which may exist with a degree of independence from visual references in the world. That's our, our fancy dictionary definition. Um, so if you're familiar with Western art, as most of you are, from the Renaissance, you know, our, our Ninja Turtle artists, our Raphaels, our Da Vinci's, our Leonardo's, our Michelangelo's, 
Um, so from the Renaissance up into the mid 19th century, all of the art was really underpinned by the logic of mathematic perspective and an attempt to reproduce an illusion of reality. So there are a lot of reasons why kind of mid 19th century sees us step away from this. Probably the most prominent being the invention of the camera and film and photography rising as a new art form, <laughs> which is frankly, it's an, own, an art bites unto itself. Um, but mid 19th century is really where we first start to see artists stepping away from this need to reproduce reality um, and be a little bit more adventurous in what they felt like they could depict. So this is where we start to see abstract art, also known as like non-figurative art or non-objective art, also sometimes non-representational art. Um, these are really closely related terms. They are, have similar, but perhaps not identical meaning, but you'll hear them used relatively interchangeably. Abstract art exists along a continuum. We can say something is abstracted without being fully abstract. Um, as I said, there's non-representational, non-figurative, lots of different ways to talk about this. Um, abstract art takes liberties. It'll often alter the color and form in ways that are conspicuous. Um, that might be partially abstract. Total abstraction, of course, bears no trace to any reference to anything recognizable. And probably our best known uh, example of abstract art in the Eastern Iowa area, of course, is Jackson Pollock's mural from 1983, which is in the collection of the Stanley Museum at the University of Iowa. Um, Pollock is probably the most famous abstract artist that most of us can name, and this is uh, a truly, truly wonderful piece of his. And if you haven't seen it in person, I'm not sure um, where the Stanley is planning on putting this in their new building when it opens in August, but I encourage everyone to take a trip down to Iowa City and see it. But of course, to bring the focus back to us as we should at our art bites. Um, so this exhibition, Abstract Ideas, is called from our collection of works created after 1950. Um, as a museum, the CRMA is known probably best for our collection of Grant Wood artworks, as we are the largest holder of his work in any public or private institution. Um, so I felt like abstract art isn't something we're known for, but we actually have a fantastic collection of it. Um, and as I was putting this two gallery exhibition together, um, I definitely could have done a four gallery exhibition. I could reset these galleries with more abstract art. We actually have a lot of it. Um, and it's fun because we have a lot of really big pieces, which I always enjoy working with. Um, so everything in the exhibition is post World War II. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, in some cases, you'll see as I go through, I'm not going to go through the whole exhibition uh, to whet people's appetites so you come in and see it. Um, but I'm going to go through some of my favorites in the exhibition. So in some cases, the subject matter is only slightly abstracted. And you can kind of tell what it's supposed to be similar to, you know, Picasso's cubism. In other cases, the artist has moved completely away from any recognizable object in pursuit of a different emotional or intellectual goal. So it's really fun to go through these. I had a lot of fun picking this exhibition out and choosing what pieces that I wanted to have next to each other. Um, so I'm just gonna share, as I said, some of my favorites with you. This first one is John Beckelman, who of course is a local artist. Uh, he taught at Coe College for many years and still lives and works in Cedar Rapids. He has a wonderful studio at the chair in the Cherry Building. Um, and so this is a really monumental piece. This is clay and mixed media on wood panel. I will tell you right now, it's an extremely heavy piece. Um, if you're familiar with John Beckelman's ceramics, you can definitely see he's still using clay here, but in a different way. Um, what I loved about this is that it evoked the night sky to me. I was kind of seeing the black field as the sky with stars on it. I love the little arch. He does this beautiful little arch feature on the side. Um, and I think it's really creative that John is still using the medium with which he's most familiar, of course, being clay, um, but he's doing it in a relatively two-dimensional manner as opposed to the 3D pieces that he's better known for. Um, so this was one of the pieces that I knew I wanted to have in from the beginning. I'm not looking forward to taking it down. It is really heavy and quite a lift. Marvin Cohn, uh, Grant Wood's best friend, Marvin Cohn, got into abstraction late in his career, which is 
such a fun discovery. Um, and as always, when I'm talking about Marvin Cohn's abstract period, I'm reminded of what a tragedy it is that Grant Wood died so young in the 40s. Um, because Cohn and Wood had very similar styles, of course. They traveled to Europe together in 1920, um, and they tackled a lot of the same Iowa landscapes, the farm architecture of the Midwest. Um, but Cohn lived for 20 more years. And it's really in this last 20 years of his career where he like moved away from representational imagery and into abstraction. Uh, so I always thought it would be fascinating to see what Wood would have gotten into had he survived for the same 20 years that Marvin did. If he would have stuck with his very famous style, and of course, Wood was a much more famous artist than Marvin Cohn. Cohn, although a wonderful artist, is definitely more of a, a local fame than Grant Wood's. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, so if you're somewhat familiar with Cohn's work, you'll know that um, in the 1930s, he started doing a series of kind of monochromatic blue doors and hallways. Um, and that's kind of what leads us into his abstract period. Again, you'll see he's still doing this monochromatic. His abstracts are largely kind of this blue gray scale, although in different tones, as we can see here. Um, but he is alluding to something. On the left, we have flute player with piccolo from 1963. And on the right is shapes on shapes number one. Uh, so in one of these, he is alluding to a figure. And Jackie and I have had many conversations about where exactly the flute player is and what is the piccolo in the work on the left. We still haven't been able to come to consensus on that. Um, or, you know, the very just genuinely abstract shapes on shapes on shapes. Uh, we have a, a large number of Cones abstracts in our collection, and they're really interesting and beautiful. I love the tones that he uses in these, but it's just a really fascinating part of his career that I don't think got quite as much love as his beautiful rolling river landscapes um, or his barn paintings. But it's a cool part of his career, and I think it's very interesting that that's where he ended up towards the end of his life, that he was almost wholly an abstract painter. This is Irving Kreisberg's Palace Ape from 1973. Kreisberg is probably one of the bigger names nationally and internationally that is in abstract ideas. He was born in Chicago in 1919 and arrived in New York City in the 1950s. So of course he's right on time to get in uh, to Jackson Pollock's abstract expression an abstract expressionist period. Um, he actually had his work included at MoMA's prestigious exhibition, 15 American Artists, where he was showcased alongside Pollock and Mark Rothko. Um, Kreisberg never abandoned figural elements in his artwork like Pollock did, so he called himself a figural expressionist. Uh, and so here, as I said, we can still see that there, you know, once we're told it's a palace ape, we can pick out the arms and legs, the head, <laughs> a bit of an abstracted banana in the middle. Um, so this is a really fun one to include in the exhibition because it's not wholly abstracted. And so we can see that abstraction isn't the complete negation of any figure or anything identifiable in a painting, um, but it does start to tear away at this, you know, mathematical perspective and emphasis on realism that we've seen earlier in the art world. Oh, this is one of my favorites. This is Chris Gallagher's Tomorrow from 1905. Um, this alone is reason to come in. This is really hypnotic in person. It's this really lush, beautiful oil on canvas. Um, and Gallagher has a really lovely statement about it. You know, it's about time and the universe and relativity. Um, but this is one that's really wonderful to stand close to and like as I shouldn't say as a curator, get your eyes and nose really close to it because it's just this beautiful, delicate, kind of a crazy rainbow of these beautiful stripes just painted so close to each other and so thickly and so lushly. Um, it's a really fun one to be in the same room with. Um, this was an immediate piece that I knew that I was going to do and the, the beautiful curve that he has is so wonderfully done. Um, so I would say this one alone is worth coming in to see the exhibition for. And Gallagher is a relatively young artist. He was born in 1954. Um, so we are showing multiple generations of abstract painters in this show. You know, it's very easy to do the Pollocks and the immediately post-World War II generation. Um, but we do have a really good representation of what those artists gave to younger artists, you know, different generations who are working in the same media. A working image. 
This is Ronnie Landfield's For Matthew. <laughs> um, this one I loved just because it's a little bit more washy and watercolory. It's less geometric than some abstraction tends to be. Um, the colors here, blue, blue and like a yellow ochre gold are probably my favorite color combination to see together. Um, and so this one drew me right away. I also wanted to have different sizes. Um, a number of these works, the Gallagher piece is really big, the John Beckelman is really big. Um, so I did want to balance that out with some smaller pieces. So not everything was a team lift when we were putting this up in the gallery. Uh, this is one of the smaller pieces and it came to us from the gift of Dorothy and Herbert Vogel gave us 50 works for 50 states. Um, Landfield was really inspired by Chinese landscape painting, which I think you can see in the washiness of his paint, which is very typical of Chinese landscapes. Um, but I love that he's left it abstract. You know, we definitely can get a sense that this might be a landscape. There is a bit of a horizon line that we can pull out here, some hills, a sense perhaps of green vegetation. Um, but one of my favorite things about abstract paintings is that they're really there for you to fill in your interpretation and how they make you feel. Um, a lot of times with representational painting, you know, obviously there's a didactic message or it's a history scene or there's, you know, something fairly clear that you're meant to learn from it in some way. Um, I think abstracts can actually be a little bit more emotionally engaging because they leave a lot up to the viewer. This is another delightful kind of monochrome one. This is Margaret Lanzetta. I wanted to be sure to get female artists in here. Um, abstract expressionism as propagated by Pollock, you started out certainly as a very masculine field. Of course, there was Helen Frankenthaler and Lee Krasner and many other women. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any of them in our collection, but certainly if you know someone who does, send them my way. Um, but I did wanna make sure we got some wonderful female artists in the exhibition. So this is Margaret Lanzetta, who was born in 1957. Uh, she studied at Skohegan in Maine, she, at the Tyler School in Rome, got her MFA. Um, from the School of Visual Arts in New York, traveled extensively in Japan. This is graphite, so pencil on mylar. And again, this is one that's really, really beautiful in person to get up and see it. <coughs> Much of Lanzetta's work revolves around repetitive patterns, just like we see here. Um, and she uses a lot of industrial materials like the mylar. Um, so here we see, the lines and the boxes. And again, seeing this in person, she's gone in with the pencil and just done these really beautiful, um, very simple lines that make up the beautiful texture that we see here. So this has always been one of my favorite pieces. Abstract art tends to be a little bit difficult to get into thematic exhibitions. Um, if you're somewhat familiar with the exhibitions I've done since I got to the museum in 2015, uh, I love a good theme. And abstract art can kind of be hard to get into an exhibition that's themed around the human body or the forest as artistic inspiration, you know, or if we're looking at a particular media, it can be hard to get in. So finally, we just, I just bit the bullet and said like, let's just do a purely abstract show so I can share all these works that I've been sitting on for so many years. I also wanted to make sure we got some 3D work in the exhibition. We have a really cool 3D collection um, and some pieces like this, again, would just be kind of a challenge to put in a thematic show that I had planned. This is Michael Lucero's um, Untitled, and this is a glazed ceramic. This is such an amazing piece, and I love it so much. Uh, it's pretty tall, actually. I would say it's about 24 inches. Um, it was fun to decide which face of this ceramic piece I wanted to show. Uh, and you'll see when you come see the exhibition in person, which one I chose. Um, I just think it's so beautiful. I love that, you know, it's not a vessel. There isn't a purpose to it, but it kind of has, as we can see on the left-hand side, handle-like parts that look like, you know, maybe it was once meant to be a pitcher or something and just got all messed up and mashed together and painted these beautiful rainbow colors. Um, and that's very typical of Lucero's art to kind of combine painting and sculpture together. He's always very aware of what color does in his work. Um, and he really likes abstracts. He says, you know, the sculpture plays with the combination of rough and jagged edges of the clay and smooth, runny appearance of his vibrantly colored paint. 
Um, there's a little bit of glass mixed in, which accounts for the sheen that we see here. So it's a really, really fantastic piece. Um, and again, one that I was really excited to be able to put in an exhibition. I just love the gentleness of this piece. Uh, this is Therese Merzda's She Whispered Again, Three and Twenty Love Letters. Um, a lot of the works in abstract ideas are really vibrantly colored, which I love, um, but I really fell in love with this one because it's so subtle. And again, I'm sure we're seeing my, my love of blue and gold together again in this piece. Um, Therese is a writer turned visual artist. She's based out of Portland. Um, if you're familiar with the Gilded Pear Gallery, they carry Therese's work. Um, but we've had this one in our collection since 2014, and I don't believe it's been out yet. Um, so I was very excited to be able to include this. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, I love the subtle geometry of this. I kind of feel like these are gold squares placed on this somewhat like sky like blue and white background. But I love that she's gone in with a pencil and kind of incised these lines. Um, this is one that I can just look at a lot and see different things every time, but it also makes me feel very peaceful. Every time I see one of these, I'm just reminded, I'm like, oh, I love this one too. This is Dina Tollefson's Study for Koi Pond. Um, so again, we're not wholly abstract here. We have moved into um, being able to pick out some figures, as it were. Uh, so Dina Tollefson was born in 1965. She's a full-time professional artist. Uh, she lives in Cedar Rapids, so she's a local gal. Um, and this is a really interesting cubist piece. If you're somewhat familiar with Dina's work, you know that she usually does um, very thickly painted um, kind of impressionistic landscapes. It's probably what she's best known for with really thick application of paint and kind of spoon-shaped uh, brush strokes. So this is a really different piece for her, but I absolutely adore it, especially now, you know, knowing that it's a koi pond, you can kind of go through here and pick out the fish and then what pieces are supposed to be water. Um, it's a really fascinating piece. And I, again, have been waiting to show it for a really long time. I think it's especially interesting knowing Dina's other work that this is so different from what I think she's become very well known for. Um, but I really love the fragmentation that she uses here. Another local artist, this is Mary Zarin's Breathe Through This, one, two, and three, a really lovely smaller triptych. Um, and this is next to the Chris Gallagher piece, that kind of arched rainbow that I was rhapsodizing about. Um, Mary's pieces are all abstract, but I used this next to the Gallagher piece because I thought the colors were so complimentary. Um, and this is from 2011, which was a period of Mary's career when she was doing um, very organic kind of non-geometric forms. If you've seen some of her later work, she's gone back to more hard edged pieces, um, but I really loved all of the curves and the total lack of straight lines in this one. I thought it fitted really well with the Gallagher piece, um, both in color and in form. There's also a particular color that I love here. I'm really into this really vibrant pink that is used in all three of them. I just love this color combination together. And I saved my favorite one for last. Um, this is a working photo, of course. This is down in our storage space. Um, this is Emmy Whitehorse's Silver Spring from 1998. Um, Emmy Whitehorse is a Native American painter and printmaker. She was born in Crown Point, New Mexico. She's a member of the Navajo Nation, um, still lives in Santa Fe. And <laughs> her paintings draw upon a personal iconography, which is based on you know, her own reflections of her natural surroundings in the Southwest. Um, and a Navajo cosmological perspective. And she combines this with abstraction. This is such a gorgeous piece. And I'll say again, you need to come in and see it in person. Um, the background is such a rich kind of dark thundery cloud going into this bright white. Um, and there's just this beautiful, she's done an amazing job of these really delicate shapes that kind of overlap and undulate and come into each other. Um, in different varieties of ink and paint. You know, some are incised much more closely. We see the repetition of a kind of paddle pattern here used many times over. It's a really striking piece. Um, and I did what I like to do, which is I had it on, I have it on a wall with a couple of other largely monochromatic pieces. 
Um, so it really, it works together really beautifully. But the Emmy White Horse piece, again, is a piece that I've wanted to bring up ever since I started working here and I saw it for the first time. And so I was really pleased that we we're able to do the abstract exhibition and showcase her because she's a fantastic artist. And this is a truly wonderful example of her work that we are really lucky to have. Um, and we've had this in the collection since 98. And I think it's been up a couple of times since then, but oh, it's a gem. It's truly a really beautiful piece. So that is just a taste of what is on view in abstract ideas. Um, and obviously, since it's up until October, whenever you come to the museum next, you should take some time and walk through it. Um, what I like to do in abstract shows is just kind of walk through and see what I'm immediately drawn to. Um, and the game that I always play in museums is my favorite piece in the gallery, you know, the one that like I would take home with me should the should the museum feel feel the need to gift one to me um, and also my least favorite piece. And then with both, I think it's always really interesting to kind of sit with, well, why? Um, and this can be really fun to do with the negatives, maybe even more so than the ones that you really like. It's interesting to sit with a piece that you don't care for and think about, well, what don't I like? You know, do I not like this color combination together? Do I not like the way these lines are all converging on the same point? Um, and I think that's especially fun to do in abstraction, um, just because you're not really responding to the subject matter in the same way people are with representational art. Uh, so it's really fun to kind of go through and see what you respond to, what you don't care for. Um, and as someone who is very lucky and gets to look at a lot of art as my job, um, it's interesting to see through lines in what I generally like in pieces, what I generally don't. And then, you know, if you look enough at enough art, you'll kind of know your own taste, but you can surprise yourself. When I was looking at this abstraction show, there were pieces, um, you know, that I wouldn't have thought that I would really be into, but ended up really liking. So it's a fun game to play, and I encourage everyone to come in and kind of soak in the abstraction. It's a really wonderful, calming thing to do. Does anyone have any questions? All right, well, thank you for joining us, everyone. Um, I hope everyone enjoys the spring weather that we're kind of having, and hopefully it'll be a little bit warmer next month. Thank you, Karen.